We'll start with the bones. We've already seen the upper parts of the bony pelvis. Now we need to look at the parts of it that lie below the pelvic brim. Let's get oriented. Here's the bony pelvis together with the fifth lumbar vertebra. Here's the pelvic brim. We'll be looking at the pelvic cavity from four different viewpoints. We look down into it from above. We'll look at it from the side with the opposite half of the pelvis removed. We'll look at it from behind. And we'll look at it from below. We looked at the features of the upper part of the bony pelvis in the last section. The bones that contribute to the walls of the pelvic cavity are the sacrum and the coccyx behind, and the lower parts of the hip bone in front and at the side. We're looking at the bones in the position they occupy when we're standing upright. In the upright position, the surface of the upper part of the sacrum is angled at 30 degrees to the horizontal. The tip of the coccyx points forward at about 40 degrees. So the pelvic surfaces of the sacrum and coccyx form a curve of a bit more than a quarter circle. The lower end of the sacrum is on a level with the top of the pubic symphysis. This big gap between the sacrum and the hip bone is called the sciatic notch. It's bridged by two major ligaments, as we'll see shortly. Now, we'll look at some details of the hip bone. This massively thick part of the hip bone is formed by the fusion of the ilium, the pubis, and the ischium. It's smooth on the inside and on the back. It's deeply indented on the outside by the socket of the hip joint the acetabulum. This is the body of the ischium, which ends below in this impressive projection, the ischial tuberosity, which is what we sit on. This sharp prominence is the ischial spine. The large hole in the lower part of the hip bone is the obturator foramen. In the living body, it's largely closed off by the obturator membrane. This is the body of the pubis. The part of the hip bone below the obturator foramen is the ischiopubic ramus. The two ischiopubic rami, meeting in front at the pubic symphysis, form the pubic arch. When seen from the side, the ischiopubic rami slope backward and downwards toward the ischial tuberosities. There are important differences in shape between the male pelvis and the female pelvis, which is adapted to the important requirements of childbirth. The female pelvic cavity is wider from side to side and deeper from front to back than the male. In addition, the angle of the female pubic arch is broader. When seen from below, the inferior pelvic aperture of the female is wider in all directions than that of the male. Now that we've looked at the dry bones, we'll look at some major ligaments which are important in holding the sacrum and the hip bones together. The weight of the body is transmitted from the vertebral column to the hip bone at the sacroiliac joint. The sacroiliac joint is strengthened behind and in front by ligaments. The anterior sacroiliac ligament in front and the massive posterior sacroiliac ligament behind. In addition, the sacroiliac joint is strengthened by two major ligaments, which pass from the sacrum to the ischium, the sacrotuberous and sacrospinous ligaments. Here's the sacrotuberous ligament. The sacrotuberous ligament arises here on the back of the sacrum. It passes laterally downward and slightly forward. 
it's inserted here on the ischial tuberosity. Now we'll add the sacrospinous ligament to the picture. Here it is. The sacrospinous ligament lies in front of the sacrotuberous ligament and medial to it. It goes from here on the edge of the sacrum to here on the ischial spine. These two ligaments divide the gap between the sacrum and the ischium into two openings, the greater sciatic foramen and the lesser sciatic foramen. Let's take a look at a complete pelvic specimen from behind and from below. The sacrotuberous ligaments behind and the ischiopubic rami in front form the boundaries of an opening beneath the pelvis that's called the inferior pelvic aperture. Seen from beneath, the opening looks like an ellipse, but it's not a flat ellipse. Because of the steep downward curve of the sacrotuberous ligaments behind and the slight downward slope of the ischiopubic rami in front, the ellipse has a marked bend in it. Here's the inferior pelvic aperture seen from above. When we look at it from up here, it's not so easy to appreciate the three-dimensional shape of the opening. Now, we'll look at the muscles of the pelvic cavity. First, we'll look at two muscles which form part of the wall of the pelvic cavity, piriformis and obturator internus. Then, we'll look at the complex sheet of muscles, collectively called the pelvic diaphragm, which form the floor of the pelvic cavity. We'll look at these structures first in a male specimen. Piriformis and obturator internus are both hip rotator muscles which arise within the pelvis and pass outward through the sciatic foramina. Here's piriformis. Piriformis arises from here on the sacrum. It passes laterally and leaves the pelvis through the greater sciatic foramen. We'll see where it goes in a minute. Next, we'll add obturator internus to the picture. Obturator internus arises from the obturator membrane and from this wide area around it. Obturator internus leaves the pelvis through the lesser sciatic foramen. In doing so, it makes a 90-degree turn around the lower part of the ischium. Piriformis and obturator internus pass laterally to insert on the greater trochanter of the femur. Their actions as lateral hip rotators are shown in volume two of this atlas. In this section, we're concerned to understand these two muscles simply as parts of the wall of the pelvic cavity. The obturator internus muscle is covered on the inside by this layer of pelvic fascia. There's an important line of thickening in the fascia called the tendinous arch. The tendinous arch goes from the body of the pubis to the ischial spine. We'll see why the tendinous arch is important in a moment. 